everybody and welcome to day eight. Sarah and I were talking in the green room about how are we day eight already or how are we only day eight already. We've already had so many great sessions wherever you are joining from in the world. Welcome if this is your first vid 21 session you are in for a treat. If you're coming back for more um, you are in, in for even more insightful um, thoughts and ideas from the wonderful Richard Young. Um, Richard has a lifetime of experience working with the Olympic sports and sports systems to improve performance. He has been an athlete, coach, leader, researcher across nine, that's nine, Olympics and three countries. Almost everyone adds more to their plate, looking for the magic. Those who reproduce world-class performance have mastered subtraction. Richard helps you reduce misaligned effort, clear the path and achieve your goals faster. Um, Richard, welcome. I had to try and do the maths on nine Olympics, like nine times four, you know, and I was just like, how is that even possible? But I can't wait to hear <laughs> your, your entire journey and uh, get your insights. So like going to one Olympics to me just blows my, uh, blows my mind. The fact that you've been involved in nine uh, is, is insane. So uh, welcome everybody. Richard, I'm gonna hand over to you and thanks again. Great, thank you, Julia. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks for the... Uh introduction i know when you do the nine times four math and you think wow how old is this guy and um how do you stick at something so long and um but when you've um probably like you in your world you've got timelines and time frames of um you know how you measure kids that's one way to measure uh education one way to measure but in sport it's typically an event so so I find I think in four-year cycles. I plan in four-year cycles. I operate in four-year cycles, and and um, might wind my family up. But I, um, you know, we approach our uh, family life in four-year cycles. Okay, what are we doing in this four? And so it's that micro meso bit. And um, anyways, thanks for uh, thanks for joining everybody and those on the recording as well. So um, uh, really good to be here and. Uh, as Julia said, um, a lot of the Olympics have been, well, all of them have been across different roles. So I've had six or seven different roles in three different countries. Um, and, and I knew I was committed to Olympic stuff pretty early. There was something I found very attractive, even as a kid watching the whole global festival and everybody coming together and then you know, the structures that the, cis, the cities built and there's problems with that, you know, we got to modernize. There's a whole different talk on, you know, how the Olympics needs to shift. But anyways, the stuff that was attractive early, everybody coming together in one place and, and, um, and fit and ready. And that was always what struck me. How do they arrive fit and ready at this time and this place and all of them fit and ready. How have they timed that? And so this was where uh, curiosity started as a kid. Um, and for many high performance is seen as a, a giant experiment. You know, you're not sure you enter the experiment, just like how we make decisions in life. You're never sure of the future, but anyways, we're making decisions based on the best evidence we've got. And so, my work is to help accelerate that experiment because um, I found I spent years fiddling around experimenting and I've worked with teams and whole sports that have fiddled around for years experimenting and and the answer really is pulling back on all the extras pulling back and, and getting clear and so we've got a chance now because of you know all the global impact and drama and, and tragedy of a lockdown everybody in a different position we have uh, family all over the world um, I'm coming to you from New Zealand Dunedin New Zealand but um, I grew up in Toronto uh, so family in Canada the states England Scotland Seychelles 
um, and lockdown is a, is a, is a disaster. And, and when we have everything taken away, we sure quickly realize what's important to us. And it often isn't what we thought. And so the opportunity in sport is to choose what we put back. And, and so that's the work I do is helping sport now, right now, choose what they put back and really visit what they've been doing for all these years. So with it being a giant experiment and we're all performers, so whether you are in sport or not, you are a performer. It isn't just for the arts. It isn't just athletes in, in medals. It's parents, it's husbands, it's wives, it's friends, it's teachers. It's, so we all have to perform. And that's communicating what we know, what we've prepared for and deliver it. So there's an interaction and a message. And that's what tennis players do. Federer is communicating with us. He may be looking across the net, but he's actually communicating a much bigger picture to a whole lot of people. And that's, you know, flow will come into that, but it's communication. And to communicate, you can't layer everything in there. You really have to pull back and choose what you um, what you decide to, to play with. So I say that high performance is an addition problem needing a subtraction solution. And the more we pull back, the more we know what's happening in our system, it's easy to add. And um, as an analogy, my son, um, uh, my youngest son is 10 and he came back at Christmas with a uh, secret Santa. And it was a giant box of puddle, puzzle pieces, like 10,000 of them. And it, it struck me, it's like 10,000 hours. You'll have heard of that. Um, Anders Ericsson's the original researcher on that. Malcolm Gladwell popularized it and it became this number that when you get to this point, suddenly you step into expertise. So my son arrived with a box of like 10,000 puzzle pieces and said, dad, look what I got from Secret Santa. Can we build this? I said, sure, brilliant, look at this, they're all different. And, and um, so here's like 2% of his puzzle pieces. There's giant boxes, they're all different sizes, like some are, look, here's Dora the Explorer, here's Lego, here's Tron, and they're all different and he has no picture. And I said, well, how do you think we're gonna do this? He said, well, we look for the edges and then we look for the corners and then we see what colors match. And that's, the start of high performance. Like we look for principles. We have no picture of how this is gonna work for us. We only have hopes and dreams. That's what we have. But when we have principles, we can start to put the puzzle together. And that's what we did. It turned out to be a big muddle, but it was quite a fun experiment and we got somewhere. And so best practice, that's heavy in science, but in performance, it's too slow, too late and it doesn't apply to our system. So performance is very personal. And so a best practice can be a distraction. It's best principles. And what's gonna carry you through to build a high performance system for yourself in your own life, in your own work. And it's principle-based and that's what we're gonna talk about. So there's some principles that have evolved from research I did comparing medalists and non-medalists. Their coaches, their support staff, the doctors, the leaders, and some principles that anyone can use to map your way from developing to high performance to exceptional performance. So, as I said, when I got into uh, the Olympics, it was watching the Olympics. And so with my dad as a kid, I built a two turn bobsleigh track in the backyard. So I'd stand on the fence and we had plywood and I'd jump on the sled and go around. And that's when I was hooked. And so I was on the sport hunt. So it was judo and gymnastics and, and I just kept getting beaten up. I was too small and light. And then gymnastics, I was too afraid of the jumps. And, the, and um, then we went to England and my uncle said, oh, let's go for a bike ride. And, and I was about 15 and uh, I said, wow, you got a cool bike. He said, oh, I was a pro. I said, where are you? He said, I've done three Tour de France. I said, you're kidding. And I thought, this could be it. It might be in my genes. He wasn't actually a marriage uncle, but anyways, I thought still there's a link here. And plus I fell in love with the European setup, the colors, the speed, the tech, all of that. So now I felt I had some kind of expectation that I could maybe be a high performance something or other. And I was really keen on figuring the experiment out. And so to compress it all together, 
that's what high performance turned out to be for me was a giant experiment, huge wins and losses and failures and dead ends. And I, I went heavy tech. I filled my tires up with 200 PSI of helium. Um, I drilled out every component because I was committed to weight reduction on my machine. And so I drilled out the seat post. Well, you, you can imagine what's going to happen. So there's, there wasn't good thinking. I wasn't putting good thinking into my into my experiment here. And, and a lot of people in high performance mistake motion for progress. So there's a lot of motion going on, a lot of action. You look around the track, the pool, um, the sailing venue, lots of motion, lots of motion, but the ones dialed in, you can tell. And this is what struck me was the ones who were winning repeatedly had a system. And like James Clear, he said in his Atomic Habits book, uh, which came from US military, which came from Greek warriors, uh, that you don't rise to your goals, you fall to the level of your systems. And systems win the game. They win the game. Every high performer has a system. They may not be able to describe it, but they have a system. And so that turned out to be my work was to make activity and thinking visible. And so then people can see the system they're in and we can start to make adjustments. So for you evolving your system into high performance, one little thing we wanna do is make sure, you know, this isn't just, um, oh, that was interesting. And then we forget about it and we move on and we keep our motion going, it's, it's action. So performers are action. They're not knowledge experts, they're, they're doing experts. And, and so for you, I probably ask two things. Why are you here? And these questions, awareness and decision are likely the two ends of the spectrum for why you may be here. Is there something you are thinking through? You may want to capture new information or is there a decision that may be related to the topic of this? So if you put that on the paper and just make a note, what strikes you for your own awareness in your context? Because your system's the winner. Nothing I'm going to say about other systems is going to be the winner. It's how you turn this into your own context. And then decisions. What decisions do you need to make? So, um, so I'd make that as a small, even if it's a post-it note, a couple of things that come from this, then um, I've done something for you to give you some sort of direction for your own high performance area. So let's um, just show a couple of slides here, not the title slide. Let's start on how, move the mouse. So when we have enough data on performance like this, so this comes from a group called Grace Note. They're based in Holland. If you want all the performance information on any athlete at any level in the world, this group is capturing it. So every country utilizes their data, which is an advantage because we're all using the same data. It's double check, cross check, Nielsen bought the company. Anyways, 500,000 athletes over 4 million performances tracked over years. And you can see the difference between the world top five, who takes the medals at the Olympics. It's the majority, uh, the majority of the medals are taken by the world top five and not much below that. So what that tells you is the medal is won years before and they are consistently world-class. So they haven't just nailed something on the day, they have planned this event. So they may be awarded the medal, but it actually happened years before. And the other thing to look at is the overall system. So across countries and, and who takes most of the medals Back in 76, you could have people in the world top 16 who were taking medals. And then top 12, because systems started to integrate. So you remember the Australian Institute, uh, the German Institute, the British started to get things sorted. Now people are starting to integrate knowledge and experience. And then you come to Sydney and now science and coaching has integrated. And then technology and talent development now become proven 
components of high performance sport and now it's the world top five and likely this year they think it'll be the world top four take most of the medals so it's not really a lottery game anymore you walk in knowing who is likely to do well and you may have some out of the blues but it's getting rare and rare consistency counts and consistency means you've got a system and not only that but the clock is ticking so say in business you have a goal, well, you may be able to delay it. You don't want to, but you've got a choice. In sport, there's no choice. So that's why it's a good model for all parts of life. We know the rules, we know the day, we know the time, we can't be late. And then you got another problem. So my, my little boy with his puzzle, if the stopwatch started, now there's new pressure. And if I say, Leo, you're not gonna be able to do this by the time you're 11. Uh, you know, physically, you're just not going to have what it takes to do this. So you better start cranking. So now he thinks not only is there a stopwatch going, but I've got limited capability opportunity as well. So you add all that together and you can see the pressure that's put on people to perform. But the systems that perform are really worth paying attention to because they're delivering under all these constraints. So here we have the simple math model for experts, which you'll have met many, and like um, like professors. You know, when I was going through PhD, they said, "Oh, probably now it's time to be adjunct professor." And I looked and I thought I had never planned on this, and I had nothing against it. I just hadn't planned on putting sports stuff into a room. I thought of putting it into people's uh, lives and systems. So with performance, things have to be pulled back. So you can't deliver everything you've got all at once. It looks really cluttered, really busy. You can tell, like the Federer model, when he's when an athlete's in flow, there's something, as an audience, we're somewhere else, like we're with them somewhere deep, and you think there's something going on. And we're able to pull this together. We can create flow through the system, consistent system work, we can actually call on flow. It isn't just a peak at a single time. There's research now on how you call on flow and, and it's system-based. So the point is to declutter. And if we have lots of stuff going on that we're adding in, there's a lot of no what's. You know, and when you're learning something, you know this, you know that, you know this, you know that. Then you have to pull back to a know-how. And, and there's the performer coming in. And the link between the two is knowing when and how to say no. And it's like the Jenga game. You might have played that, you know, the little blocks and, and they're stacking up. And there's the two-way Jenga. So you can build it up. How easy is that? Then you have to start taking things away. And you can see how people look at the tower. Oh, do I go down low? Do I go up high? They're connecting. It's a system game when you start to pull things apart. And that's the analogy for creating a high performance system. It wins when we pull stuff off it. And the faster we can fail something and eliminate it, the better we can move into a tighter place for our high performance system. So we interviewed athletes and there were 2000 and 80% um, of them. We asked three questions. What would you keep start stop for the next event? And the ones who had repeated a winning performance owned 80% of the stops. But when we looked at the population, they were 5% of the athlete population and they owned 80% of the stops. I will stop doing this, I will not do this, I won't do that. And the others were in the addition game. So most of them were starting and keeping things in their, in their performance matrix. So when you look across the spectrum, so having interviewed talented young, young there, many of them are young kids, like 10, 12 years old, snowboarders, and, and how they describe their performance picture is very simple. 
So I wouldn't say they're low performers like this graph indicates, but they're more new performers. It's very simple. Uh, so I get to the venue, I love to jump, I do this, I, I try to cut back on KFC. They've got very simple little rules. And then you get to the high end and oh yeah, this person works, tried Pilates, doesn't work. Uh, this works perfectly. I've got this person in my, uh, the routine is like this. I need three months at altitude. I need, and very simple. And then you get to the middle and it is busy. This whole middle part is the busy middle. This is the land of opportunity in high performance. And it's not just a population opportunity, it's an individual opportunity. Because expertise is contextual. So you put a virtuoso violinist into a sailboat with no training, there is no virtuoso in that boat. So we have average and we've got low all over us. And we can't pretend we're high, nobody is. There's no superheroes out of all the interviews, all this time, the Olympics, there is no superhuman who produces a repeat medal, nobody. It's not talent. So they, some of them have come through what they didn't have. They've actually maximized a weakness and turned it into a strength. So they arrive and they're not afraid of their full color palette. That's what I call it, is, is all the low, the high, the middle. Your whole palette is you. And when you bring that to your game, and we know performance is communication, if you're hiding something, avoiding something, fixing something, you can tell it's one of the layers, one of the layers when there's a, a reality and authenticity to the whole spectrum, performance changes. And so we've got power in this middle. Like if you want bang for buck, this is where you go. You find what the top end is, but then you focus on shifting the middle. And so that's what I do in mentoring and coaching. We identify the middle. Many people don't know what it is where it is, what it looks like. And then we start to shift and we start to move it into a high performance. Mm -hmm. And the approach isn't what people normally think where we're fixing, we're not fixing, we're creating something, creating a future. And now this, this average performance component starts to fit into a future we're creating. So we're not dealing with the issue, we're dealing with the future we're trying to create. And that's where high performers live. They live in, in this creation component. So we all have some of this. We all have some of the middle. And this applies in business as well. So McKinsey had done a study uh, over five years of Fortune 500 companies on how they moved up to high performance. And out of the companies they studied, 8% moved to high performance by reducing their actions, reducing and aligning their actions. So very similar to this smaller athlete study we have. And then 73% were in the middle. And what they were doing in the middle is fiddling with efficiencies and effectiveness. So if we're playing the game of nothing needs to go, because we feel that's risky, we've got the Jenga, Jenga game, uh, I don't want to pull anything off, so how do I... How do I just play around with efficiencies? I push this one in a little bit and move this and maybe I'll paint this one. It's a fiddle. And there is your experiment in high performance. And this is the area that pulls us down a bit. So the best in the game, actually I can show you this is probably better. I'll put this off. So here's the best in the game. Here's what they have. Very simple. I should have done green, St. Patrick's Day, but anyways, we got a blue one. And this is the system you're in. So it's three dimensional. There's things in there. There's you, there's your coach. Nobody is uncoached who achieves anything at the highest level. Nobody, because you can't see the system you're in. Somebody has to replay it back. Evidence has to play it back and somebody else watching how it's all working is helping you see this system, play it back, then you can start to optimize it. And that may sound like a bit of a bummer. You can't see the system you're in, but you can't. It's just a factual bummer. You cannot see the system you're in because you're in it. Like the fish can't see the sea. 
And this is where the opportunity is. So when we see the system we're in, suddenly things on the outside start to make sense. And you may have heard of marginal gains, which came from British cycling and where all sorts of things like new pillows and cryogenics and probably helium, uh, it might've been before my time, but helium in the tires and all these aspects adding, but what doesn't make the news is that they know their system. They're not randomly adding stuff. So you may have, you know, soft, easy options, right? Doesn't fit. If you don't know your system, you know, what the Russians are doing, what the Americans are doing, what the Australians are doing, looks pretty good. How do I get it in there? It's got to fit. This looks like magic. Look what they're doing over there. It could even be new tech. Oh, it's the eight ball. I can't believe it. We got to get this stuff rolling. How do we get this? They're doing rollers. They're exercising on the plane, depressurizing it. That was a rumor that went around a few years ago that they were practicing on the plane, depressurized. So it was like altitude. That could be the eight ball doesn't fit. As soon as you know your system, things start to appear that, oh, that'll, that'll align. This isn't going to slow us down. This isn't adding. This is leverage. Now this drops in and this fits. And we can see the leverage when we see the system we're in. So if you have a system that you've got that may be a bit complicated, this is your chance to sit back without adding and just have a look at how effective is your system. So we're playing in this leverage space, whereas most are in the effectiveness and efficiency space. And as we've come to a point where we're landing on system integration, um, if anybody has questions, no problem. If you have questions after the fact, uh, later on, that's, that's fine too. Um, you can just pop them in the chat box. If there's anything you want to ask now, I will be asking at the end what awareness has struck you. So what point may be on your post-it note for awareness? And what point may be a decision point? Doesn't have to be ironclad decision, but you may be considering a couple of things. And those would be good to hear from you so that you're having a thought of how this context is going to fit your own system. And leverage is where the best teams play. And we talked about the spatial. So this is kind of spatial leverage. So what's in your system is spatial leverage. And there's a timing leverage too. So there's the past, the present and the future. And the best are operating in this middle part. And part of my previous work was on reviewing the reviews, performance reviews, and they were massive research undertakings. It's all hands on deck in sport when it's a review, particularly if there's a loss, then there could even be judges and lawyers and, and everything else. But that isn't effective leverage. This is undermining people and processes. The, the, the intention wasn't to lose, it, it just, happened and it happened just like the metal happened months before the loss actually happened months before but getting it in reflection is too late there's high emotion people put stories together you know how our brains work we we connect dots unintentionally and i figured that out and all the interviews with athletes that i've done where they've got a very compelling story but it actually isn't the truth and and we need the truth in high performance and that's in this middle part so we have leverage in the box and we have leverage in the space and time around the box. And that's when we get to this point of a deep simplicity where we're not just calling for the sake of calling, but we're removing the right block on the Jenga tower at the right time. And it is actually lighter, faster, more efficient, and it's easier to spot opportunities when it's like that. And there was an interview with uh, a gold medalist rower, uh, Mahi Drysdale, who won uh, the Olympics 
twice. He's won the world championships. He set the world record, I think, twice. And he was ill in Beijing. He was expected to medal, but he finished with bronze. And the interviewer said, well, my, that's really disappointing, isn't it? I, I guess you're going to have some plans in place on how you can you know, arrive healthy next time. And he said, no, I'm just going to train harder so I can win when I'm sick. So you can hear the shift from fixing to creating. So can I arrive healthy? Well, I tried this time and sure, we're going to learn some lessons. But what if it goes wrong again? What's my leverage point? How about I was so fit? I can win when I'm sick. And there's a high performer with a system behind him. When you've got a system behind you, there's a different mindset, different proof, conviction, we call it. It's mindset on rocket fuel. And, and that's a system belief component. So they arrive at this point of simplicity where things start to get really simple and they can see interconnections. And there was a story when, after I finished coaching, I went to Nepal to hike. And I was on the plane and, and an athlete had sat beside me and he'd been to the Olympics and he said, oh, I, I, when I finished the Olympics, I came here and I hiked and I got to a small village and all the village huts were covered in, uh, they were uh, full of smoke and the kids were coughing and everybody had breathing trouble. And, you know, I'm an endurance athlete. I know the power of, you know, good air, clean air. And so I raised money, installed chimneys in every hut. And that was a year ago. And I'm going back uh, to, to see, you know, the impact of all this, all this good work. I said, brilliant. We checked our flights and he was flying back the same day as me. We said, hey, let's sit together. So we did, and, and uh, six weeks later, and I said, how'd it go? He said, disaster, absolute disaster. I said, what happened? He said, so I built the chimneys. He said, there were about 80 huts, put the chimneys in. No one told me that the smoke keeps the spiders out of the straw roof and the spiders eat the straw, and then the roofs collapse. So he said, all my chimneys were in a rusted heap. All that time, effort, money, all in a heap, useless. And he said, I can't believe it. I forgot like a core thing in performance that things connect and you got to know the connection. And that was the next thing he'd said. And we were talking about systems and interconnections and the high performers, no connections. They know how things connect. And that's how they build high performance systems because they know what leads to what and why the chimney won't work even though it looks like a great idea for these kids. Long picture, won't work. And that's the game we're in, is figuring out past, present, future, the system we're in, and delivering exactly what's needed at the right time. So we call that strategic simplicity. That it's, it's a pullback, deliberate pullback, that has long-term advantage. And let's show... Um, I was going to put it on your brow. I'll actually draw this out. Yeah, that's, that's going to be uh, that's going to be better here. So here's an example of the system. So when we're talking about um, best principles for sport, there's a ground floor, and then there's the high performance components of the system, and then there's the top end, the exceptional part. So. So if we draw this out, you're welcome to draw it as well. It's like a tic-tac, uh, tic-tac-toe board, right? So, um, so if you draw two lines, two lines like that, and then when you write this out, then you've got this for good. And, and you're gonna have a little bit of a numbers game on this to see where your, where your system currently stands. And you can use this as a check-in at any time. So first off, we're on the ground floor here. And awareness, now these all link together. And awareness is, if I put the whole board on here, so awareness is like the blue dot on the blue wall. And, and when we see the system, it's not just us, but it's us and the system. A lot of athletes and performers arrive with self-awareness but not system awareness. And 
That's the accelerator when you see the part, me and it, me and it. And there's the connection with the coach and the support staff. They're talking about the performer and the system they're in. And often only one or the other gets the priority, but it's a balance between the two. So where you are, and you can do a digital decision-making, this came from someone called Robert Fritz, who is, he's written some fantastic books around identity. He's a composer uh, in the States, and he uh, is a business uh, strategy consultant, and he takes musical composition and the system behind that into business and into performance. And, um, and I found some of his work fascinating. So, and he came up with this idea, digital decision-making. So plus one, minus one, getting better, getting worse. That's it. We don't need to know all the details, but for you, is it a plus one or a minus one? Getting better, getting worse. If it's staying the same, a zero, if we're into computers, it's either worse or better. Is it, is, does it supposed to stay the same? That's better. If it's not supposed to stay the, same, stay the same, that's worse. So then we move into truth. And many teams are operating in agreement mode. And that's what the data on all the athletes and the performance reviews have said. Even a performance director for one of the Olympic teams said it's easier to agree than it is to tell the truth. It just calms the water and we perform better. It looks that way, but there's something missing when the truth starts to fall apart. So are you in agreement mode or in rigorous honesty mode? So rigorous honesty or agreement in, in your work and your partnerships with your, with your system. The other area is the standard. So we need to know where we're heading and many sports, believe it or not, don't know the standard. There's a lot of reccees, they're called, where there's visits, figure out the water. We did this for Beijing where we had uh, pollution meters on the top of buildings. We had tidal boys in the harbor and they ran for two years sending data back here uh, just so we could compare against what the government was publishing on uh, heat, humidity and pollution. And the military, um, uh, surgical teams, so there are strong reccees, they know where they're going. And it's often an obvious fact that's missed in a system is what's the standard? When you know the standard, you're on a hunting trip. If you don't know it, you're on a fishing trip. So are you on a plus one or a minus one? And you can see where these start to line up. Like if we had down here, this is me, the performer. This is us, the team, and this is it, the system. So we'll, we'll see what's moving as we move from growth to high performance into exceptional performance. So next in line is we know us in the system, we're honest with each other, we know where we're going, and we're collecting the right evidence. And measurement is key, and we gotta know our questions. And where are you? Are you collecting the right evidence or are you hoping things are coming off? We move over to routine. And here the high performers are deciding, they're making action happen. And the lower performers are ruminating, you know, constant consideration, but there has to be action in high performance. So there's either a ruminating or a, or a deciding. And are we innovative, which can be a problem, or are we stable? Are we always changing or are we stable? As one Olympic athlete said, my routine is coming home. It's like coming home. Whatever country I'm in, it doesn't matter. It's like coming home. And so where are you on a digital plus one, minus one? And then over here, we're in the me column, values. Now the importance of sport starts to shift when you get into higher performance. Growth, higher performance, exceptional performance. And one Olympic medalist, three golds, three Olympic games said, this isn't the medals, it's much deeper for me. And it isn't just that they've won and now they can take their foot off the medal run. 
there was a depth they found at the start and they started to accelerate when the depth of high performance started to matter to them. So are your values known and lived or are they unknown? Then we move up, get rid of me, and we move up to conviction. And this is now the except, exceptional performance end. A German cyclist won the Olympics and I saw him in the, in the uh, walkway under the track and, and, um, and this was his second gold, another world record. And, uh, and I knew him quite well. And I said, what do you think's made the difference? Like what, what's happened for you all this time that's really made the difference? And he said, Uber Zagong. And I didn't know what it meant, but I remembered the word. And I went and got the translate, no Google Translate then, but got the translate, it means conviction. And so I was really curious and I talked to him after and he said, I've got a system that works. He said, I'm so convinced about the people the processes that I know I'm the top, the icing on the top, and, and I'm completely convinced I am capable because I'm in a system that's capable. That changes everything for you when you're in a capable system. And, you know, if, if Elon Musk, you go to his house, say, and he's got post-it notes on his fridge saying, go Elon, you know, you can do it. Come on, today's the day you'd think, okay, something's missing, right? It looks quite cool. You know, wow, even Elon needs affirmation. But under that hope, there's something missing. Our brain knows if we need to, you know, the, it, it's good. There's nothing wrong with that, nothing wrong. It's the next question down is the leverage. What am I missing that I need post-it notes on my fridge for? And it's typically evidence. And there was one uh, rower who had meddled and then fell into this anxiety pit in the States. And her training just started to fall apart. And so it was all hands on deck with uh, sports psych and support, but her coach decided to play a different game. Think, well, we've got to train. We know the day, we know the time. It's not debilitating for her. So there are aspects that do need like deep care and attention, but she was safe. She just wasn't performing. And he decided to shift focus into more evidence more often. And so every time he, said, he saw her, he'd tell her about her PB. He'd tell her what today's training was like. You know, brilliant, Paul, like you had no crabs today. Fanta, which is when you catch your, or fantastic technique. You're the leader today in the technique and real facts, not, not just pump up facts, but evidence. And she started to climb, started to climb. And it turned out to be a pattern that he used repeatedly. So instead of fixing anxiety, she was safe. It was just a performance problem on the spectrum. There is this middle average anxiety, pulling her down, pulling her performance down. How do we fix that? And it's about fixing, not fixing, it's about creating. And most in the average are in a land of fixing and it just keeps adding up and adding up and adding up. And then over here, two left, one is flow. And this is what we can call on past, present, future, hindsight, foresight, insight, all coming together. It's a flow is a timing component where we are in the game, deeply in the game. And we feel this connection to something much bigger. And we can call on this when we have a system we believe in, in a system that's proven to us. And that's where the last one comes in is creation. And it isn't an oscillation, which is the fixing component. So for instance, um, the young rower's anxiety does that need to be fixed? Well, we may be back and forth on a long game here, trying to fix anxiety. What are we trying to create? We're trying to create a performer like Mahe, a winner when he's sick. We're trying to create a performer who's performing when she doesn't believe it. And he turned that into a 
desired future and they started to move forward. So he got out of the oscillation track and into the moving forward. So the highest performers are not fixing the present, they're creating the future. And that's where their, their outlook has, uh, has shifted. So are you oscillating or are you advancing? And again, on these, it's a plus one and minus one. Like that. So there's an overall set of principles that we can use in any game. So where are we on the scale? Which one seems to be the main thing? One of those probably stuck out as the main thing. And maybe you could pop in the chat, which one looks to be the main thing for you? Or if you want to pop on the screen, that's great too. Which one looks to be the main thing? for you in the system you've got, which one is going well, top of the heap, and which one may not be going well, but looks like strong opportunity for you. So if you had a plus one and a name, values or routine or something, and a minus one in a name. Routine, strong opportunity after last year, yep. And there's the connection to timing as well. Definitely routine, Josie. And that looks to be the opportunity. And which one would you say is going well? Which one looks to be the top performer for you? Or is that the top performer? I don't know if that's a plus one or a minus one for you. values, top performer. Excellent. So if we're in a, in conviction, yep. Excellent. That's great. So when we're in, when we're in a changing time, like now, um, some of the work I do is in values and security, financial and home life security has lifted higher than anything else in the past year, which makes, makes perfect sense. And so when we look at the timing, which is the you know, past, present, future, they all have an impact on which ones are at the top, they're dynamic. So it's like a sound engineer with the equalizer. You know, 50 Hertz needs to lift, 30 Hertz need to pull that down. And so this is a nine panel equalizer. And so for today, as you've said, so Josie awareness and values are top performers for you. So that combination, excellent. And so that's in the, the U phase, which are the areas you can control, which is a high power point in creating your high performance system. That line of me, and you look conviction, values, and a routine is core and good. Okay, that's good. So we've got routine three times. And so there's a strong analogy in Nautilus when the values and their self-awareness are on, they talk next about routine. So they know where they fit. So I'll just point out that you're on the right track here, like where you happen to be paying attention to you and where you're moving to is a personal component and you've got that in shape. So anyways, you can see how this nine part is, uh, is a good little equalizer to do some measuring. So I'm going to wrap up there. And if um, I'll pass it over to Julia for um, what's happening next, but there's a swag pile that Julia has. So there's two white papers on evidence that matters and high performing behaviors that, that I'll put in there. And, um, but it's been a pleasure to be here and for Julia and Sarah to organize such a big event over three weeks, this has been brilliant. And I've listened to a lot of the sessions, they're fantastic. So it's so a real privilege to be here.
Thanks so much, Richard. I'm definitely going to add your session to the list of fantastic sessions. You win the award for the most amount of notes I've taken in a session. Um, it was so in, so insightful. I feel like um, if we were in a stadium, I would be like cheering you on. Like that was <laughs> epic. It was so so good. Um, so many great comments. Um, Vanessa said, as a parent of athletes, this is amazing. A model to show them and start working, creating from growth high, exceptional values to conviction, especially. Um, yeah, I, I feel like you've just given us nine years of Olympics in 45 minutes, which is absolutely um, insane. Sarah's saying, agreed, I'm going to be re-watching this one for oh, sure. So uh, I love me. I love your work. I can't wait to see your book come out. And uh, yeah, next time I'm in New Zealand, we're, we're going to go and sit and chew, chew this over some more because uh, exceptional, exceptional stuff. So uh, thank you very much. And thanks for the comments, Heidi, Vanessa, Josie, and thanks for organizing Sarah and Julia. And, and um, any questions from people online? Because as I know, like me, I'm the offline watcher guy most of the time. So uh, if anybody has offline questions, no problem.